There's not everything that's in the judge's handbook, but I've picked out my favorite points and you're gonna get a lot of my comments about it. So, um, and the other thing you should know is that you're going to see, many of you will see some irises today you've probably never seen before. Um, there are two types of Siberian iris and we will get into that shortly. But um, the, the second type doesn't grow many places in the United States, but it does grow in my garden. And so you'll get to see some of those today. Okay, without further ado, maybe. Okay, um, I need to do a disclaimer. Um, I'm going to use the terms Garden Siberian and Sino Siberian, and you'll also hear me use the numbers 28 and 40, and those refer to the 28 chromosome Garden Siberian or the type of Siberian that most people grow, uh, or the 40 chromosome Sino-Siberian. Now those are not botanically accepted terms officially, um, but they were taught to me by uh, Jean Witt and Carla Lankow. And since this is my program, I'm going to choose to use them. Um, and if I offend anybody, I apologize right now. Okay, straight from the handbook, um, not the Siberian section, but right at the beginning. Um, being appointed a judge in the American Iris Society is a privilege, and you are you have the obligation to serve the American Iris Society and the gardening public. And I want to emphasize and the gardening public, which relies on your on the selections made by judges, so they know what are good irises to grow. Um, I want to emphasize that you should vote only for good irises and not for your favorite hybridizers, not for your friends or not for people in your region. Okay, I'm off my soapbox, moving forward. Okay, so um, there are two groups of Siberian iris in the series. Um, one of them is uh, Siberica, and that is the species group that um, most of your hybrid, hybrids come from. And there are three species of iris that have led to the gene pool that make up today's modern hybrids. Um, and those are Iris Siberica, Iris sanguinea, and Iris typhifolia. The second group is the subseries Chrysographes, and those are the 40 chromosome Siberians. And there are currently nine um, recognized species within that group. Though I want to draw your attention to Iris Phragmatatorum, um, we have dropped that from the handbook, the new revision of the handbook that will be coming out at some point in the near future. Um, there's, there's no known um, plants of it anywhere in the world. Um, no, uh, there's only anecdotal evidence that it ever really existed. So we are dropping that one out. Oops, all right. Um, there we go. Um, and, um, but most of the rest of these you could come and see in my garden. This Iris Ramsey on the bottom right, that was just recently discovered um, on the in India in the Himalayan mountains um, on the India side. So that one was just recently, just within the last 10 years found. Okay, um, the 28 chromosome Siberians are native to uh, Northern Asia. Um, they stretch into Europe and maybe into Japan. Um, there are populations in, in Japan, but there, there's some discussion over whether they are native or whether they were introduced and have naturalized. So if you want to stretch that circle out to cover Japan, feel free, it won't offend me. Um, the 40 chromosome Siberians come from the China and India on the Himal uh, in the Himalayan mountains, generally up around oh, between five and 10,000 feet and uh, um, have very different cultural requirements, very different growth habits. Um, if it were me trying to uh, classify them, I would make them something other than a Siberian iris, uh, but nobody left that up to me, so here we are. Um, from the handbook, um, it says that there are hybrid cultivars from both of these uh, uh, series. And one authenticated inter-subseries hybrid known as Fortel. Um, 
And this is the only iris in the program where you will see the name. Um, and it is the only iris I'm aware of that is specifically mentioned in the judge's handbook. Um, so there you go. It's Fortel and it's a cross between a 28 chromosome Siberian and a 40 chromosome Siberian. Uh, very aggressive grower. You might try this one in South Louisiana. Okay, there are tetraploid irises within both subseries. Um, and I have a picture on the left of a, 20, of a 28 chromosome Siberian that converted to a tetraploid, mean double, double the number of chromosomes. And so it actually has 56 uh, sets of chromosomes. And um, I don't have a picture of a tetraploid in the 40s, um, but I will say that Dr. Thomas Tamberg from Germany, he, hybrid, he hybridizes them and works with them and he grows uh, the tetraploid um, 40s, which I guess you would call 80s. Um, so here's what you need to know. Um, the tetraploids differ somewhat in size and sub substance um, from the diploids. Um, but you, you judge them just the same. Everything we talk about today has to be true for both the diploids and the tetraploids. And um, uh, so there. This is a really important one for me. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you why I put these pictures up here. Um, judges should not allow their personal preferences um, on color or characteristics to affect the rating of an iris. Um, that, that's really important and it's something I struggle with all the time because I have, in my mind, a vision of what a perfect iris should look like. And, and to me, color-wise, the one on the left um, um, is not in my, in my wheelhouse. It's not a color I particularly enjoy and when I wander through a garden, I barely even notice them. Um, but as a judge, you need to take the time to notice them. And um, in every aspect, the iris on the left is a wonderful iris and grows superbly, um, nice tall stalks with lots of buds and a couple of branches and beautiful um, um, gently arching foliage. It, it has everything a good iris should have. It's just not my personal color preference. Um, but when it came time to vote for it for awards, um, it I, I was right there voting for it. Um, so you need to you need to to um, get past your own preferences. The one on the right is what's called a multi-petal form of a Siberian iris, and multi-petals can tend to be a little messy, and and I don't like that in an iris. Um, but again, um, I need to get past that. And there are multi-petals that are out there that I have voted for all the way to the top awards. Um, and um, so take your preferences, put them off to the side, judge the iris for what it is. From the handbook, it is important to note that any point system for judging a Siberian iris should be taken as a guide and not a straight jacket. So we're gonna, we're gonna go through a point system in just a moment, but note that um, I don't know anybody who goes out in the garden and point scores every iris they look at. Um, as, as a hybridizer, I will do it from time to time if I have two very similar looking irises that um, I'm trying to decide which one's good enough to introduce, I will, I will do my point scoring. But, um, um, but, but if you do point score, just remember it's a guideline. It's not, a, it's not something you have to live and die by. And this one here, um, you should pay attention to because it's going to be on the test. Um, the accredited judge should grow newer Siberian irises. This is particularly important for irises that are competing for the higher awards. Um, and, and what this means is that being a judge can tend to be expensive. You know, depending upon the type of iris you prefer to grow. Um, if you're a tall bearded iris grower and you need to grow a representative um, example of the newer introductions, that, that, that's an expensive endeavor because I, 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 Andy would probably be able to tell better than I can, but there are a lot of them introduced every year. Um, and even just weeding down to which one's got the AM, if you're supposed to be growing 
all all of the ones that have the AM so that you know whether to vote for it for the the Worcester medal or 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 the Dykes medal, then then it should probably be in your garden. Um, and that can be an expensive endeavor. Um, and only when you see an iris growing in many different places um, and for many different years should you should you be considering it for an AM or a special award. So um, um, again, looking at a catalog and seeing a pretty picture doesn't mean it's good enough to vote for. And uh, this one is on your test too. The top award specific to the Siberian iris is the Morgan Wood Medal. And that's what it looks like. And here's your scale of points. So um, starting at the top, distinctiveness and garden impact. Um, and so what is distinctiveness? Um, distinctiveness is your ability to walk out in the garden and see an iris and know its name without a name tag. And, um, and there are a lot of irises out there where I can do that. And there are a lot of irises that are out there where I cannot do that because there's so many that look just like it. Um, and, and it's important that um, distinctiveness um, is a top priority in every class of iris. Garden impact is, an, is another, um, another thing. Um, I have uh, many irises that I truly love. And when I walk out in the garden, you, you, um, you almost wander by them because they don't stand out. Um, that might be because of my color preference or it might be because they just don't, they don't grab anybody's attention. Um, so um, the garden impact is a really important thing. Um, your plant, is worth 45 points. And that's broken into three different categories, vigor and de disease resistance, your stock, buds, branching, and length of bloom, and your foliage. And then the flower is worth 30 points. So right there, you know that the plant is more important than the flower. And, and why is that? Here in the Puget Sound, we have foliage for seven or eight months out of the year and we have a flower for two or three weeks. Um, I know in places south of here, you have longer growing seasons. So you have longer, um, longer plants, you know, that, that are around for a much longer time. So, so it's really important that you have a nice looking attractive plant that adds to a perennial garden. Um, somebody that um, is not an iris grower, somebody that would not tune into a program like tonight, might have two or three irises blended with their peonies and, and their um, poppies and um, delphiniums and whatnot. And um, the, the, the Siberian foliage needs to be attractive all year long so that they can complement those other plants while they're doing their thing. Okay. Uh, back to the flower, um, broken into three categories, form, proportion, and substance, colors, patterns, contrast, and textures, and durability. Okay, uh, reminder that this is a guideline, not a straight jacket. Okay, we'll start with distinctiveness and garden impact. And right from the handbook, distinctiveness and personality mean the overall combination of positive features of the iris that distinguish it from its peers and make it readily recognizable. And this is one of the 28s that's out there and has recently won the Morgan Wood Medal. Um, and this is one where I can walk into any garden and if it's in bloom, I can tell you exactly which iris it is. Um, it's a fabulous grower, a unique color, it has great presence in the garden um, and uh, it has a lot going for it. Very unique coloring. Um, and this is uh, one of this. If I could only grow one iris, this would be the one. And this is uh, one of my 40 chromosome irises. Um, not one I hybridized, but one that I grow. And uh, there is no other iris in any category that looks anything like this one. It, it is truly unique. And, and if it's blooming in a garden, uh, you know exactly which one it is. So distinctiveness and, and how they perform with the surrounding plants. Vigor and disease resistance. Um, 
so you should not focus on the flower alone. Um, and and vigor and growth habit sometimes are overlooked and and they're 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 the most important part. Um, making sure that when you send an iris home with somebody you know, so you share it, that you know it's going to do well in their garden so that they they can also learn to love irises like we do. And um, if if we were to award pretty flowers with with problems with disease, um, then in the long run, the worthiness of the Siberians would, would decline and um, people would just stop growing them. So it's really important, particularly for the hybridizers to be careful about this, but also for the judges not to reward plants that do show um, lack of vigor or, or disease susceptibility. And in the 28s, um, they're, they are susceptible to a soil-borne fungus called botrytis. And what happens is you have this great big beautiful clump and all of a sudden all the foliage dies back except for a few little wispy fans like you see here. Um, and, and that was a three-year clump that um, looked like it was going to bloom beautifully that year. And it went from big and beautiful to that in about three weeks. So um, it's a problem. Botrytis is a problem, um, particularly in cold weather climates, cold and wet climates. So here in the Puget Sound, where, where it's, it's cold and rainy and we rarely get above 70 before Siberian bloom season, um, botrytis is a real problem. And there are award-winning irises that do well everywhere else in the country that I will not grow because this is what happens to them. Um, and it's tragic. Um, so it's something that, uh, and I should add, um, I, I am able to track back a lot of those that I can't grow to one parent maybe 20 generations ago that um, when it was in my garden, it showed um, susceptibility to botrytis. And then many, but not all of the children generations later that came from that will also show that. So it's, it's a genetic thing that um, that these plants are susceptible. So it's something to watch for. In my 40s, um, the same thing happens with, but it's a different fungus called Phytophthora. And, and the same thing happens. They just, they look good, they look happy, and then they just start to die off. Um, the moment I see that in my garden, they get dug up and they go straight in the garbage can. They don't even go to my compost heap. So, um, and then every once in a while you'll see uh, an iris uh, that that will show a virusy streaks on their petals, and that's not broken color. Um, that's a perfectly good iris that we have grown for many many years, and um, this past year it just one of the clumps that we grow just developed these streaks on it, and that and that's a virus. And um, so everything that showed this tendency um, got dug out and and thrown in in the compost heap. But um, the rest of the plants seem to be doing well, and um, and we'll see if uh, if it continues with uh, what I left in my garden this year. So another thing to watch for. Patrick, um, yes, sir. You have a couple of questions. Yep. And uh, the first one is: Can you describe the texture of the flower? Uh, I can, and we will get to that in just a little bit. Okay. And then um, the next one, I don't know, it, it was about the iris that you said, if you could only grow one, uh, it would be that one. Uh, somebody wants to know the name of that one. I, I can share that because it's, it's an old one that's been around for quite some time. That is called Dotted Line. And it was hybridized by Lorena Reed uh, somewhere in the 80s and ended up winning the uh, Founders of Cigna Medal. So um, it's a good one, and uh, the really great thing about um, Dotted Line and all the other 40s is that they are hummingbird magnets, and they come right in and start um, start drinking the nectar, and, and it's, it's a pretty cool thing to watch. Um, I do have to warn 98% of you out there, um, the 40s have very strict requirements as to where they want to grow. And if you have hot, humid summers, you are out. Sorry. 
Um, they also don't like extreme cold. They they do well down to zone six. If you're zone five, they probably won't do well for you either. So um, good, that's dotted line. And then there's a question about the one on the left of that, uh, the, the reddish one, what is that one? Oh, see, now you're making me share names. <laughs> okay, that one is uh, Marty and Jan Schaefer Sachs introduction called Paprikash. And uh, truly the color of paprika and just a fabulous iris. And that one, the Morgan Wood Metal, what, a year ago, two years ago? Maybe three. Okay. Good? Okay. Yep. Moving on. See, we did all that. Uh, stocks, spuds, branching, length of bloom. So straight from the handbook. Stock should be upright and resistant to wind and weather. No Siberian stock should ever need staking. And um, for all you peony growers out there, um, and I'm one of those, um, irises are not peonies. You should not have to stake them, put cages around them, do whatever it takes to keep the blooms from laying down in the mud. If, if you have a Siberian iris, um, where it regularly drops its st stocks down into the dirt, then um, you should not ever vote for that, not for any award at all. Um, occasionally, um, if you get a really, really out of the ordinary rainstorm or windstorm or tornado or hurricane or earthquake or whatever, then it might happen and you can forgive it. But, it, but in an average year, they should never lay down, not ever. And most of them, none of the ones I grow do that. And none of the new introductions that I grow uh, show any sign of it. And, and I think our hybridizers are doing an excellent job of, of, of creating good quality plants that, that don't have that problem. Uh, when properly placed, a high number of branches and buds is desirable since it increases the floral display and extends the season. Um, the judge's handbook goes on to say that, um, that in the modern hybrids, one to two branches is pretty typical with the occasional three branch iris out there. And, um, and all of that is true. Um, what's really fun is that a lot of the hybrids out there um, are showing multiple buds in the terminal um, spade. So like this one here, um, you can see four, and um, and I've seen as many as five, and anecdotally have heard of seven in the terminal bud. So um, and, and that's really cool. As long as they open in good succession, so that the first bud completely disappears before the second one opens, and that completely disappears before the third, and so on, so that they're not crowding each other and and turning. Um, a beautiful blossom into a great big mass of petals that um, is just not attractive. So more buds is better um, unless they misbehave. And some Siberians send up a second crop of bloom stalks a few weeks after the first and we call that repeat bloom and it is a very desirable trait. Um, we find that um, for, for beardless iris in general to rebloom, um, soil temperature is really important. And um, as long as the soil stays cool and moist, um, the, the types that tend to rebloom will do a, a much better job of it. So once the soil get, warms up and gets too hot, then they just shut down. But as long as uh, it's cool, then they tend to rebloom. And here in the Puget Sound area, I have, I don't know, I have uh, 120 different Siberians that I'm growing. And this past year, I had 27 of them rebloom to some degree. And um, my favorite one um, bloomed during its regular season, took about two weeks off, and then started blooming again. So it bloomed from late May, took two weeks off, and didn't stop blooming until October. And so that's the kind of bloom season we like to see in the Siberians. Um, and so that one um, will forever get my votes until it's out of the award system. So 
Uh, the ideal branching presents the flowers close to the stem, but without overcrowding. Unlike tall bearded irises, um, candelabra branching is, is um, a real detriment to the Siberian irises. They put up many more bloom stalks than a tall bearded. And if you get candelabra branching out there with buds two, three, five inches away from the stalk, they're interfering with each other and, and it's it's a nightmare, it's a mess. So um, short, short branches, um, flowers close to the stem, but not overcrowded, that's what we're looking for. And of course the flowers should be presented at or above the foliage. Um, flowers down in the foliage don't do us any good at all. Stocks, buds, branching and so on. Um, the relative size of the flower and stalk should be in balance. Large flowers on very short stalks can look ungainly. Um, and that's true. However, I always remember back to um, one of my favorite arrowbred irises called Anacrusis. In my garden, it, it only ever bloomed at, at six inches tall, but it had this huge tall bearded size flower and I loved it. But um, the one great thing about the arrow and arrowbred class is that Many of the things we find as faults in other irises are, are, are relished and rewarded in the arrow class. And so that's kind of fun. But in the Siberian world, um, large flowers on short stalks, um, not a good thing. Uh, the reverse, however, um, is not true. Um, tall stalks that carry a lot of flowers, um, neatly organized and blooming um, gracefully uh, is really attractive. And this is an older iris um, that has just, you can see it has just tons of buds and good branching. And when it's in full bloom, um, it's like a, a, a flock of white butterflies just hovering over the foliage. It's a glorious thing. So, so um, small flowers on tall stalks, uh, not a bad thing. It, it's a good thing. And um, a feature of some of the Siberians is the red or purple spays. Um, and that comes from the species Iris sanguinea that has the, the red spays. And, uh, and it does do a very nice job of making the buds really attractive before the flowers open and gives it an extra week or two of, of garden interest. So um, that's to be rewarded as well. Foliage. The uh, color of your foliage is light green to dark green to blue green. And I have a note here uh, that says the 40s can have yellow green foliage, which is also attractive. It's not chartreuse yellow green, but just a, just a hint of the yellow on the green. And your foliage should be upright or, and spear-like or gracefully curved in a fountain effect. And to the right is the upright version and to the left is graceful fountain what you should never ever have is foliage that flops over um, onto the dirt so you can't walk by without stepping on the foliage. Um, it should be upright or it should be graceful, but it should always be attractive. Um, and if you, have, if you have ugly foliage, you should not be voting for that iris for any kind of an award. Oh yeah, tendency for foliage to clap is bad. collapse is bad. Um, and the moment that happens in my garden, the irises come right out. Um, for your flower now, you have form, proportion, and substance. And, and this is true, that there's no preferred size or form for the Siberian flower. Um, some of the other classes, you know, you, you get the ruler out and, and the standard should be this wide or this tall and the, the fall should be this wide. And, and you do the math and you come up with an equation. There's nothing like that in the Siberian. Um, there are many different forms. Um, and um, as long as they are pleasing and attractive, um, they should be encouraged. Uh, they should be graceful, balanced, and symmetrical. Um, and, and they say with good clarity of outline, um, I might take umbrage with that, but, um, but for today's sake, uh, that's what the judge's handbook says and that's what you should believe. Uh, this is straight from the handbook, new forms. And I'm going to say that this is not new anymore. It might've been new when that version of the handbook came out. Um, 
I don't think it's going, it says that in the new version of the handbook. Um, but um, there are, are forms where the standards have been converted to false and we call those um, doubles. And this is an example of a good double. So for the standards to be converted to false, they need to show a signal. And the ultimate goal for a six fall Siberian iris is that the, the top three petals should be as large as the bottom three petals, making the flower very round. Um, and that's the ideal form for a, um, for a double, um, or at least something to strive for. And then there's multi-petal forms. And um, that can have, I've counted as many on this white flower, I've counted as many as 27 petals. And then I open the seed pod and instead of seeds inside of the ovary, um, there's more petal material. So even the, even the seeds have been converted to petal material. Um, and, um, and I think they're fun as long as um, you meet the other requirements above where they um, are symmetrical and have a uh, good outline and they're graceful um, and reasonably balanced and emphasis on the word reasonably. Form, proportion, and substance. Um, so the standards and falls, but the standards should be held either horizontally or vertically, or perhaps even at a 45 degree angle or anywhere in between. All of that is, is good as long as they hold their form for three days. If you have upright standards that flop over um, after a day of, of nice sun or even a little bit of rain, then, then um, that should be faulted. Um, and, and this is a good example of an iris with an upright form, upright standards. Okay, and this is an excellent example of an iris with um, your horizontal standards um, that stick straight out. And, and both are acceptable and anything in between is acceptable as long as they hold their form for three days. And with these um, Siberians, the style arms are right out there for God and everybody to see, so they better be attractive. And um, some of the hybridizers are getting some really great effects with their style arms with, with different coloring, um, the feathering of the midribs, um, the crests can be wavy or spiky or, or all kinds of different shapes and colors. And, um, so when you're judging a Siberian iris, particularly in a, uh, in a seedling patch or the seedlings on a show bench, you should be paying really close attention to the um, style arms because um, they're right there on top and everybody's gonna see them and they better be attractive. Patrick, there's a question um, uh, going back a couple slides, I think, great clarity of outline. What does that mean? Great clarity of outline. That means um, uh, it's not a big mass of petals um, that you that. Um, boy, that's a good question. How do you how do you describe that? Um, I can picture in my mind a a a, a flower um, that I grow that I used to grow um, that it, it was a multi-petal form. And, and it never ever made um, anything that looked other than a mop. And so I wanna say uh, everybody knows what an iris should look like. And so you should have that kind of an outline in your mind when you're looking at a Siberian, um, but then you have to take into account that a six fall uh, form should have that nice flat round look to it. And a multi-petal, should have a nice um, ball of, of um, petal material, kind of maybe like a peony, but it, but it should be a nice, clean, um, nicely formed flower that, that you recognize easily as, a, as an iris. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. I'm not sure I was prepared to answer that question. I, I know what it means in my mind. I've never had to express it out loud before. Okay, that sounds good, thank you. Yep. We did that. Okay. Uh, 
Yet another pr serious problem is if a flower lacks substance, and that's the underlying strength which gives form and firmness to the flower. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this now, um, and then somebody's going to prove me wrong, but I don't have a Siberian in my garden, and I don't remember ever having one in my garden that had poor substance. Um, I think the hybridizers for many, many years have been doing an excellent job with this, and, um, and, and substance really isn't a problem anymore. Um, there are some older um, Siberians I grew that that wouldn't hold their standards up. Um, and that's a problem. I, I, I should say in the 40 chromosome category, there are a lot of, most of the hybrids that are out there now do not hold, have really great substance. And um, what, when I'm hybridizing with them, I pay real close to that and they need to hold their standards up and their, their falls should not collapse. And, and I'll show some examples of that in a second. But, keeping in mind that they need to have substance, um, but it's also important that Siberians have thin flexible petals and they move attractively in the breeze. And, and like I mentioned with that uh, iris earlier, that um, a good Siberian in full bloom at peak bloom in, on a breezy day should look like a, a flock of butterflies hovering over the foliage. It, they should just flutter around and be beautiful. And, um, um, and then when the wind dies, they should come right back to their normal form. Um, they, they, should not, they should not appear windblown. Okay. And ruffling brings variation in form too. Um, and um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of ruffles. Um, I cannot get enough of Keith Keppel's tall bearded irises. He, he, his ruffling is, is immaculate and I, I, I just love his irises. So. Um, we don't get ruffling quite like that in the Siberian world. Um, this is a typical, this, this is a very ruffled 28 chromosome Siberian iris. Um, and you can see just the edges of the petals are a little bit ruffly. Um, they do a better job in the, in the um, tetraploid um, varieties. Um, this is a tetraploid and it, and it has, much nicer ruffling and, and consequently tends to be um, one of my favorite irises. Um, in the 40s, there is no ruffling. What I'm showing you here, I went through probably 200 seedling pictures and that's the most ruffly iris I could find. Um, and that's not very ruffly. I would say it's probably not at all ruffly and that the petal was just having a bad day. So um, something to work for. If you love ruffles, um, 40s are probably not your thing. Colors, patterns, contrast, and whatever it says next, I can't read it. Um, color in Siberian irises, they cover the gamut. Um, as with other irises, we don't do red very well, um, but every other color is there. Um, and including if you grow 40s, there's the near black versions. Um, Iris chrysographies is, is um, the blackest iris I've seen. So um, all the colors are there. Um, this sentence for, direct from the handbook has been deleted for the next version. Um, they, they vary from soft to brilliant and should always be clean and clear. Um, and we added um, a bit on color blends because the hybridizers that are out there now are working very hard with blending of colors and they're doing some really good work. And um, we wanted to make sure that the color blends were being added in so that judges um, could um, award them um, if they deserve it. And, and many of them do and will. So, um, so there. Texture, somebody asked about texture. Um, and, and it lists here several different textures that Siberians tend to show. Silky, satiny, velvety, suede, or diamond dusted. Um, most of the Siberian irises have a very smooth petal. A and whether you wanna call that silky or satiny, um, they're very smooth. Um, every once in a while you come across one that, that, that I would call suede. Um, which which has a little bit little more texture to it, 
than than the silkier satiny. And and I hope everyone knows what diamond dusted is. That's um, get little um, crystalline crystalline um, flecks on top of the petal that sparkle in the sunlight. Um, you see that in Siberians a little bit, but not anything that um, I would write home about. Um, I do want to mention velvety because it happens in the 40s quite a bit, um, that velvety texture. And, and the reason I want to bring it up is because it, it's, it's a very nice texture. It's, it's beautiful. It catches the sun in a way that makes them glow. And, and, and it's really attractive, except um, it also collects pollen. And so when the, the pollen um, drifts off the stem and it falls down to the fall, uh, onto the falls, and then you have a beautiful blue iris with little white speckles all over it um, from the pollen, and it's not attractive. So that's something else to keep in mind um, when you're looking at these textures is, is what mother nature does to those textures when they're out, out doing their thing. So um, keep that in mind as well. And please raise your hand, whoever asked that question, if I didn't answer, um, appropriately, give me a clue as to what you'd like to hear me say. We do have another question, Patrick. Um, okay. Are tetraploids found in nature or were they induced by chemical treatment? They were induced by chemical treatment. Um, Dr. Curry McEwen first did it back in the, I think his first introduction was 1969 of a, of a tetraploid. And um, um, subsequently, um, he, he, he continued to do it for many years, um, both through chemical conversion and also by um, hybridizing the, the, um, the tetraploids. Um, they are, they are, I don't wanna say they all are, many of them are fertile um, and, they, and they cross well, be tetraploid to tetraploid, they cross well. Um, I, I don't think that there's an example of a, tetraploid to diploid cross that has ever that has ever worked um, but um, yeah oh, it was only ever done um, it started by chemical but now you can cross tetraploid to tetraploid and I believe Bob Hollingworth is still doing tetraploid conversion chemical conversion um, in an attempt to get a really good yellow tetraploid so um, so there Thank you. And there's a comment uh, uh, says, thank you. Texture was defined very well. Okay, good. I did something right today. Durability. Durability is the ability of flower to remain attractive over several days. And your Siberian flower should be attractive for at least three days, um, except in extreme weather. Um, and um, they, yeah, they should be able to withstand, um, well, this says adverse weather conditions. Um, adverse is, is, uh, is, a, is a strong word. Um, you know, hurricane is adverse um, and no, no iris should be able to withstand that. But, but you should be able to withstand rainy days or bright sun. Um, um, and, and that center iris is a is a forty chromosome seedling of mine. That um, that picture was taken on a sunny day, and it opened in the morning. And within an hour of the sun on it, the standards withered away to almost nothing, and the petals just drooped like uh, they had um, I don't know no substance and zero durability for this flower. So it, it was um, unceremoniously dug and thrown in the compost heap immediately. Um, didn't even get a second chance. So um, you, you, they need to be able to withstand weather and, and bright sun. And, and the, the flower that just showed up on the right, that, that's a, a, a tetraploid seedling. Um, and, and I only put that picture in there to just to show a tetraploid. Um, it does not um, represent what I'm about to say. Um, and that is that the durability of a flower can be too great. They can be too durable. Um, if if I, all irises, the, the 
the blossom should last its three three or four days, and then it should gracefully um, wither up and and cast itself aside, leaving room for the next bud to open. And and there are tetraploid iris Siberians out there that um, they don't do that. They they wither up and then they just hang there. Um, and unless you go out and deadhead, they they really interrupt and really disturb the next buds as as they're trying to open, and, and that's a serious fault. Um, that's a a life or death fault in my book. Um, if I see an iris doing that, then um, consistently, then it it just needs to go. It's not a good iris because if, if the next bud can't open neatly, then then um, then it's just not a good iris. Okay, so not faulting the iris in the bottom right hand picture at all just needed a picture there and that's the one I chose. Um, show bench judging. Um, and I'm sorry to say, I don't have any pictures of show bench judging. So you just got pretty pictures from my garden. Um, for introduced cultivars, and I love how the, the Siberian um, section handled um, the show judging for Siberian irises. Um, they made a couple of simple statements. Introduced cultivars in a show are judged against the criteria of an ideally grown example. Um, and, and so what that means to me is um, if I look in um, the registration book and I see an iris, uh, a Siberian iris that was registered at 32 inches and it was put on the show bench and it is 38 inches tall, I'm not going to judge it down. I'm going to say that that the um, grower did an excellent job of growing it, um, better than expectations, and and I'm going to uh, um, consider that while I'm deciding what kind of an award to give. So um, so you are you are judging uh, against an I ideally grown example of an of that particular iris. Uh, and you're 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 judging the grower and not the hybridizer here, and so um, I can think of examples in the bearded iris where I have a friend, um, a judge who does not like open standards um, on bearded irises, um, and, and I've seen that person judge and try to judge down an iris that that is known to have open standards and, and that's not the correct way to judge an iris um, on a show bench if, if it um, was introduced having um, whatever um, whatever form um, it was introduced as if it's showing that on the show bench then then it should be um, considered a, a good iris so um, whether you think it's a fault or not and, and this is my favorite, um, right from the handbook, it says exhibition judging under tall bearded irises may act as a general guide. Um, so we didn't have to rewrite that whole section on, on, um, on show bench judging. And, and probably every section should be judged on the show bench under the same criteria, um, in my opinion. There, there is the uh, point scale for show bench judging, and this is it. And and it changes um, quite quite a bit from from garden judging, where now the flower is far more important. Well, not far more, but more important than the stock and and the, and obviously the foliage. So um, um, again, a guideline, not a a straight jacket, and. Um, and there you go, those are the points. Condition and grooming, 25. And then seedlings is a whole nother thing um, that you treat completely differently. Um, now you really are judging the, the hybridizer and, and not the presenter. So um, fingerprints on the stem, maybe a, a, an, an aphid climbing up the, the, the spathe or or a spider dangling from one of the falls, um, you would you would certainly um, downgrade an iris, um, a, a named iris on the show bench 
for those things. For, for seedlings, you wouldn't do that. Now you're looking for something new, something different, um, something novel. Um, colors, textures, patterns, um, something something that's attractive that, that you've never seen before. That's what you're looking for in the seedling um, on the show bench. Um, more branches, more buds, um, that kind of stuff. That that's that's what you should be rewarding on the sh on the in the seedling category on the show bench. And and a perfect flower and stem that offers uh, nothing different um, from existing cultivars um, that should not get your blue ribbon on the show bench in the seedling category. So um, there we go. Now that's that's my talk for today. And uh, unless there's more questions, we will move right into the test. I don't have any questions at the moment. All right. Question number one. And um, Gary, you tell me, I've got questions and answers here. Um, you want me to just scroll through it kind of slowly or do you want, how do you want to handle that? Um, yeah, I think so. Just. Um... You know, just take a um, few seconds for each one. Yep. Okay. The highest award specific to the Siberian iris is the Morgan Wood Medal. And I warned you this was going to be on the test, and there it is. And the answer for that, true. Twenty eights, forties, and tetraploids should all be judged using the same criteria. And before I answer this one, um, I'm going to note that um, though I truly, truly adore and love the forty chromosome Siberian irises. Um, I would think that none of them should ever win a major award in the Siberian category, simply because they do not have a growing range um, that allows enough people to grow them. Um, the 28s grow just about everywhere. Those of you in the very, very Southern um, parts of, of the States um, will struggle with them, but otherwise they, they grow just about everywhere. 28s, not so much. I'm sorry, 40s, not so much. So they should all be judged using the same criteria. That's true. Staking a stem to keep it off the ground is acceptable. We, we are not peonies. No, no iris should ever flop on the ground. Unless you're growing something like iris cristata that grows right on the ground. Plant is more important. This was uh, unintentionally a trick question and I apologize. The plant is more important than the flower in the point scale. And I meant this for garden judging only, not for show bench judging. So, um, for those of you who want to argue with me, I apologize in advance. This was meant for garden judging. I should have been more clear. And that's true. The plant is more important than the flower. And what is a little Botrytis among friends? A little attempt at humor. Um, um, Botrytis, bad. Gracefully arching foliage is preferable to upright foliage. And one of the great things about the Siberian section is that there's not very many things that are preferable to something else. Um, 
And so that that's absolutely false. Um, they're both preferable to foliage that flops on the ground. Um, but uh, upright and, and gracefully arching are both equally uh, attractive in their own way. I saw a picture once, I can effectively judge a Siberian. And I want to emphasize this a little bit, please, if, if you don't feel you're competent to judge, if, if you have not seen a representative number of um, irises growing for, uh, for three years, two years, three years, five years, um, you should not be judging that section. Um, I, I, I feel very comfortable myself judging the Siberian. Um, I grow um, all the new I, I bring in all the new introductions every year. I do the same thing with Japanese, so I'm very good. I think I'm good judging those every year. Uh, many other portions of my ballot do not get filled out because I cannot grow or see or, or um, I'm not competent enough to to judge that to to vote them um, every year. Um, Louisiana's, I don't think I've ever um, voted for a Louisiana in that section at all because I just we just can't grow them very well up here. So so please only only vote the ballot for um, the irises you you have seen growing and blooming for the requisite number of years. Vertical flowers, vertical flower forms are to be preferred over horizontal. There's that word preferred again. And again, the answer is false. Early or late blooming Siberians should be given extra consideration. We talked about rebloom, um, which which leads to late blooming Siberians. Um, what I didn't mention um, was that um, there's one of the three species of Siberica um, is called Typhifolia, and that was I'm, I'm going to say recently, but it was within the last 20 years hybridizers started using typhifolia in their hybrids because it is a, an early blooming species. It will bloom two to three weeks before um, the Siberica or Sanguinias do. And the seedlings um, off of it tend also to bloom a week or two earlier than the other um, than the other hybrids that are out there. And so, you know, extending the bloom season is always a good thing. And whether you're you're early because you've used typhifolia, or you're late because you've you're developing reblooming irises. Um, both are good. Good, bad. I like Terry Aiken, so I'm going to vote for his iris. And Bruce, I saw you tune in. You can tell him I said this. And that's bad. And that's my friend, Terry Aiken. Who loves to hybridize reblooming Siberian irises and other irises. A Siberian iris with except exceptional garden impact should be rewarded. And I'm going to say true as long as all the criteria are met. You know, it, it's got a beautiful flower, it's above the foliage, the foliage is nice, um, it doesn't flop on the ground, um, and does everything else that we talked about, does all those things well. Um, if it has exceptional garden impact, it should be rewarded. Multi-petal forms are be to be discouraged because they lack symmetry.
And I will say absolutely false. The multi-pedal forms that lack symmetry should be discouraged, but multi-pedal forms that, that have good symmetry and good everything else, uh, they should be treated like every other iris and, and rewarded uh, accordingly. And my last question, being a judge can be an expensive endeavor. And I'm sorry to say that that one is very true. And that's the end of the test, but we have, I'm gonna do a little promotion. Join us for the 2021 uh, well, okay, 2022 Siberian Species Convention. We postponed it a year because of uh, COVID restrictions. Um, we are hoping that borders will open up and people can come from Canada and New Zealand and Australia and parts unknown. And we hope you can join us in Seattle next year. Um, it will either be the last weekend of May or the first weekend in June um, here in the Seattle area. And we'll be featuring three gardens that have guest iris plantings. And um, in my garden, we have planted about 140. Well, we added to our species iris collection to where now we have about 140 different species iris in the garden. And um, Jan Sachs has agreed to lead a species iris trek through the garden talking about all the different types and where they came from and how they grow and and all that stuff. So it's going to be a fun weekend. Uh, please plan to join us. And that's my program. And thank you everyone for staying with me for so long. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Patrick. That was thank fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Very good. As you know, uh, we have been working on an update of the judges uh, training manual. So uh, a lot of judges are aware of this and are uh, asking very specific questions about the judges training manual. And uh, so I just wanted to say that. And uh, you did very well, Patrick, <laughs> in answering oh, those you. questions. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm.